I'd, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. And my name's Jeff Olshawn, and I'm the co-convener of the Rainbow Atheists, which is a community group being supported by Humanists Australia. And I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight, uh, including some of the uh, representatives of Humanists Australia, including Marianne Cosgrove and Rod Bauer from Victorian Humanists. And thank you to everyone who is here. Um, I'd, I'd like to also start by uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on, on which we are Zooming. Um, and I pay my respects to their elders and communities past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Um, and I remind people, yes, we are recording. So if you have issues, please be aware of that. And also, could you please keep your microphone muted uh, unless you're asking a question at, at an appropriate time. Um, I'd like to, in particular, um, welcome and thank Andrew Copson for being here today as our speaker. Andrew is the Chief Executive of Humanists UK, the President of Humanists International, and a former Chair of LGBT Humanists UK. And he's here tonight to talk about the last 100 years of humanist activism for human rights and equality of LGBT people and in the global situation today. Uh, hello, Andrew, and welcome. Hello, thank you very much. It's good to be back in Australia. I've been here there twice during uh, the lockdown. Um, I feel warmed by it. Um, so thank you very much. And it's great to see humanist organization uh, taking off there uh, so much more. It is currently here, sub-zero, I think minus three. Um, the cold wind is rattling through a uh, very drafty English window um, and I haven't had my breakfast. But apart from that, um, everything is going very well in my life. I suppose it's a nice warm evening uh, for all of you. I'm going to uh, make some general reflections really about uh, LGBT rights, the human rights and equality of LGBT people and humanism and the humanist movement. And then I hope there'll be uh, an opportunity for some sort of uh, discussion. So humanist organizations for almost as long as they've existed, which is about 130, 140 years now, um, and everywhere in the world that they exist, which is in about 100 um, uh, countries now, have had as part of their agenda, almost everywhere and almost at all times, um, the equality of people who are different um, in various ways from um, everybody else. And in relation to lesbian, gay and bisexual people and trans people too, although the two histories are rather different, um, it's really obvious to see why humanists should take that view. So there's two things I think about a humanist approach to life that, that propel us in the, in, the, in the direction of equality, specifically um, for LGBT people. The first is obviously that a humanist approach to life is one that is explicitly and completely and solely um, informed by a scientific uh, view um, of what the world is like. You know, when we try to understand the universe, when we try to understand the behavior of things, and that includes the behavior of ourselves, human beings, as part of um, uh, the material universe, when we try to understand that, um, those phenomena, we look to reason, evidence, and the great organized enterprise of science to make sense of it. And that tells us straight away that contrary to what some people have thought um, in the past, who have not um, used uh, these tools to understand ourselves, contrary to what those people have thought, there is nothing um, unnatural um, or um, perverse about um, sexual orientations towards people of the same sex. This is something that is, there is hardly a species of animal um, in which we can't observe um, same sex intercourse or pair bonding. And human beings are no different. Human beings um, are, because we're connected to um, every other animal on this earth through the process of evolution that have produced us and that produced every other living thing on this planet. Um, there's no reason to, to think that we would ever be different. So there's nothing um, strange uh, or um, abnormal in the pejorative sense of the word about same-sex orientations. And so humanists are going to automatically, or should be um, automatically comfortable with the reality of that situation. And so I think that that's the first way in which, the first reason why um, humanists um, will feel that way. And then there's a second set of, 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 of reasons about um, trans people and, the, and, and, and simply the fact that gender identity problems can be resolved by 
um, gender reassignment and that that too is an objective reality that just we can see um, around us and again we can see throughout time. So there's, there's, there's that reason why humanists are going to be comfortable and, and in advancing this agenda, that the sort of science what is true, here we see it, sort of side of humanism. But of course, then there's the moral side of humanism that provides probably um, the greatest um, impetus towards humanists being active on LGB issues. And that's because even if um, everything I've said about same-sex orientations being you know, part of life um, part of the natural world, even if that weren't true, humanists would still want to defend the rights um, of people to pursue their own relationships with whoever uh, they wished, um, as long as there was consent. And the reason for that is, is, is because there's a moral principle of freedom of choice um, that goes along um, with humanist uh, morality. This is, um, largely as I've just described, the idea that if it doesn't harm anyone, if there is no harm um, to others, then every human being should be free to pursue their idea of the good life um, for themselves. And that includes good relationships, fulfilling um, inner life, as well as the connections that we make um, with others without interference, either from the state, which we see too often in the lives of LGBT people, of course, terrible state interference, or by religious institutions, even more so we see that around the world and in history, or by tradition and conformity and outmoded law, anything that inhibits, other than the rights of other people, anything that inhibits the individual person's freedom of choice um, is something that humanists repudiate and humanists affirm the freedom of choice of every individual. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. Firstly, because you know, we just believe that the, the, the pursuit of happiness um, is uh, the way in which the human being can come as close to completion in this life as, um, as possible. And we don't want to inhibit people's personal development. And of course, we believe that this life is the only life that we have. And so um, if you're going to uh, find happiness, if you're going to find fulfillment, if you're going to attain any sort of um, satisfaction, then it needs to be now, it needs to be today. Um, and nothing should, should hold us back from that, apart from a due respect for the rights and freedoms of others. So it's just a no brainer um, that humanists are going to be um, supportive um, of the human rights and equality of LGBT people, just as they are of anyone um, whose rights are inhibited by tradition or uh, religion or, or, or state, overweening state authority. And indeed, that's what we've seen ever since um, humanist organizations uh, got going. I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of the um, involvement of the humanist organizations in the UK with the uh, evolving story um, of LGBT rights, the human rights of LGBT people, because that's the context which I'm most familiar. Um, and then I'll say something at the end about international um, matters. The problem with being Chief Executive of Humanist UK and President of Humanist International is that you never really know why people have invited you to speak. So it could be one or the other. So you have to try and cover both. But I'll speak mostly about the UK because it's early in the morning and my international brain hasn't warmed up yet. So certainly um, in, in the UK, humanist organisations have always, like I said, been associated strongly with the idea of human freedom and of freedom of choice. Um, and in the late 19th century, when humanist organisations really started going in the UK, we're celebrating our 125th anniversary this year um, in Humanist UK. Um, in, the, in, in the late 19th century, humanist organisations um, really got going. This was a strong theme and there was a strong feeling around um, organising for gay equality um, around the idea of uh, human solidarity, of sort of social love. And many of the early humanists who were associated with the drive towards um, the human rights and equality of gay people um, were also utopian socialists, organizers of that sort. You think of names like Edward Carpenter. Um, Edward Carpenter, of course, um, was in some ways very attracted to uh, Eastern philosophies, as lots of 19th century humanists were actually, they sort of slightly exoticized and um, idealized actually, um, you know, native uh, religions and beliefs of, of places like India and China quite often, they sort of saw these as, um, as almost like humanistic religions. 
um, because they made great allowances for um, human diversity, because they made great allowances for different um, a diversity of thought. They weren't the sort of homogenous, they weren't in these, in these guys' eyes, um, they weren't the same sort of homogenous oppressive religious institutions that they saw had dominated European history. They were, you know, freer and there's a lot of Orientalism in that attitude and probably doesn't bear too much analysis. But um, nonetheless, that, that was what, one of the things that inspired them. But they were humanists by our definition, even someone as um, esoteric as Edward Carpenter. And people like Edward Carpenter, if you're not familiar with his life, then there are some very good, um, two very good biographies of him. Um, he in a sense, opted out of society. He settled um, in, uh, the, in the countryside um, and he lived, although a very middle-class man, um, with a, a very working-class partner um, who was uh, much younger than him. Um, he wrote a great book called The Intermediate Sex, which was, was about, um, uh, um, about, about sexual orientation as we would uh, describe it. Um, and and this, his, his pattern of living, the fact that he chose to, as it were, come out of society um, and live with someone who, um, even if that person had been of the opposite sex, would still have been an inappropriate match for him in the eyes of society because of the difference in class, because of the difference in um, background, um, because of the difference in their present uh, circumstances. His, his attitude reflected very much what, what I said um, just a moment ago, that humanist activists who, and humanist um, people who pursued a humanist lifestyle in the 19th century um, were people for whom their, the, uh, the ideal of equality of different sexual orientations went hand in hand with this wider ideal of social solidarity. And that's embodied in the relationship that Edward Carpenter had um, with someone who in every way to Victorian society would have been, you know, his inferior and inappropriate um, match, not just because of sex, as I say. So they were utopians often, they were socialists. Edward Carpenter in particular talked about this idea of spiritual democracy. He believed in um, uh, the love between men, certainly at least, um, as being a leveler of, 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 of social inequality, as being something that would drive a broader equality um, in this world. And he and the, and the many people around him like the founders of the Humanitarian League, which was another humanistic organization in the UK at the time, um, had this attitude. So in the late 19th century, you get this sort of um, interest in, uh, from humanists, you get this interest in LGBT equality on grounds of both personal development, individual fulfillment, a commitment to the idea that love as a force can change society as well as transform individual lives. And you also get a commitment to it in the wider cause of, of human solidarity. That's the same sort of um, world from uh, world of ideas at least from which one of the most famous 19th and early 20th century uh, gay humanists uh, comes and that's E.M. Forster. Any of you, um, he was vice president of, of Humanist UK um, and a great humanist activist. He wrote um, many uh, essays and did many broadcasts in addition to his obviously more famous novels um, around the human condition that put a humanist tilt on these things and of course he wrote um, the great gay novel um, of, uh, it, it's an Edwardian novel really, although it's published in the 1970s, it, it, he himself said in, in his own um, note about the novel, it wasn't published until he died, of course, um, that it was a very Edwardian novel, that the world that he was writing about had, 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 had died. Um, and the world he was writing about was that world of Edward Carpenter, um, that world where um, you could maintain this ideal of uh, inequality of people of different sexual orientations in the context really only of a wider equality of human beings. So again, an idealist, um, someone who was prompted towards, um, prompted by his own sexual orientation um, towards a bigger concept um, of the freedom and equality um, of every human being. And I think that any novel of E.M. Forster's that you read, um, you can detect immediately um, those sorts of themes. Um, the, the necessity for people to connect over boundaries to understand each other, the necessity for the individual um, to live an integrated life themselves, to connect the different parts of their own personality and to live authentically, to live truly. So this, this was the flavour um, of LGBT advocacy within the humanist movement in the 19th and early 20th century. In the middle of the 20th century, of course, um, there's, a, there's a decided shift. Humanist organisation in the UK, at least, 
um, becomes um, less about idealism personally, you know, in terms of the development of your ethics um, and the development of ethical communities and the development of, um, of, of your own personal uh, code um, and becomes much more political. And this is true across the humanist movement um, in the UK and Europe and the world at the time. In the, um, and it's true in terms of the campaigns that humanist organizations start launching um, for you know, freedom of speech, um, for race equality, and for all sorts of legislative alterations um, in you know, outmoded uh, Victorian, in many cases, laws. And it's true in the humanist approach to um, sexual orientation and to LGBT equality. So it's now, of course, that we move into the um, political phase uh, of humanist UKs and, and wider humanist campaigning on LGBT equality. And this is the age when no campaign embodies this more really um, than decriminalization. So the decriminalization campaign in the UK that, that was finally successful um, in the 1960s um, is the, becomes a cause celebre for the humanist movement. Many humanists are involved in it. Humanist UK, under its then name of, of, of the Ethical Union and the British Humanist Association, very actively involved in it. Humanists in Parliament are organised um, uh, around it. Um, Leo Absey, who's the um, Welsh Labour MP who brought, was famous for bringing private member bills um, for the uh, decriminalisation of, of male homosexuality and also for the liberalisation of divorce laws, which was another humanist cause at the time. Leo Absey, who uh, brought bills in the 1960s on this on this issue um, was uh, a key member of the parliamentary humanist group as well and that was obviously the source of his commitment um, to uh, decriminalization and humanists are all over this in fact the the, the extent of the involvement of, of humanists in, in decriminalization the decriminalization, decriminalization campaign is only now becoming clear as historians begin to analyze the networks um, that existed. Um, Callum Brown, who's a, a Scottish historian at the University of Glasgow, has written a book very recently about humanist organisation in the mid-20th century and just how many of the progressive reforms of that um, time were the product of humanist organisations, not, uh, not necessarily um, uh, literal organisations, but networks of humanists communicating with each other in Parliament and outside Parliament. And Leo Abse is a name to, to remember in connection with that. We also at this time see far more women emerging um, as gay in, in, in British society, um, coming out, um, feeling a moral impulse to, to do so in order to, to improve um, the lives of others and also to live more authentically themselves, just as those 19th century humanist advocates of, of LGBT equality did. But, but now the message is no longer just about personal development, personal fulfillment and um, uh, you know, wider human solidarity. It's more edgy, it's more political, and someone like Maureen Duffy, um, who was the first gay woman in British public life to be open about uh, her sexuality when she came out in, in, in the early 1960s. Um, she's still with us, thankfully, um, a, a patron still of Humanist UK. And she's 80, in her late 80s now, um, but very active, comes to all events and is very uh, vocal still. Um, she, she, she said that there was a moral imperative on people to come out, to do that, um, not just for personal development, um, and those personal feelings, but for the assistance of others and to make a political statement. Um, and that's the sort of era that we see in the mid in the mid 20th century of, of humanist organization. And of course, decriminalization was was very successful. But it was it wasn't just gay humanists, by the way, who were in favor of decriminalization. A.J. Ayer, the philosopher um, A.J. Ayer, um, who's a very famous academic philosopher and was president of Humanists UK um, at the time, um, or maybe he was present afterwards actually, but, but he was anyway, he was very, very involved. Um, he was uh, a notorious womanizer and philandra, uh, unfortunately. So um, he was uh, a linchpin of the campaign to decriminalize things. He chaired the, the Committee for the Decriminalization of Homosexuality. And he famously said that he thought that he was the ideal person for that job because no one could accuse him of being self-interested. Uh, in the pursuit of decriminalization as a notorious womanizer and, and, and philander, and I suppose in part that was good branding. But it was all humanists, therefore, um, not just the gay ones, who were fighting for decriminalization. And I think that's important because I think humanists really, straight humanists, are really the earliest allies, you know, before that word was even coined in that way, um, of, of gay people generally. 
But we're now in the mid 20th century in this story of, 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 of gay humanists and humanists campaigning for, for gay equality. And, 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 and you'll have noticed that we don't yet have any, as it were, any gay humanist organizations like these, like Rainbow Atheists, for example, that, that, that you're here with uh, this evening, as well as humanist organizations. There are gay humanist organizations. And in fact, in 1979, um, a gay humanist organization was started um, in, in the UK. And it was the product of of what really was a sort of Christian fight back in the UK against the progress that had been made in the 60s. Now, some of you may know already or may remember well um, the, the prominent uh, campaigner Mary Whitehouse, who was a, a campaigner for what she called morality in, uh, in public life and, and in law. Um, she was a sort of Christian uh, fundamentally, she did lots of rallies with Cliff Richard and with the other sort of Christian guys about, you know, um, bringing Britain back to Christ and uh, ending um, uh, what uh, she saw as a, as, a, as a progressive wave. And she, in the 1970s, um, gave a speech in which she said that there was a gay humanist conspiracy to, you know, pervert society and to wash away uh, Christian norms and so on. And at the time, of course, there wasn't anything of the sort. There was no gay humanist conspiracy, at least uh, not uh, in the secretive way that she, there might've been an open conspiracy, but not in the secretive way that she implied. But a few gay humanists thought that a gay humanist conspiracy sounded like a very good idea. And so they set up the gay humanist group uh, in 1979, uh, which is today's LGBT Humanist UK. And that really gave a very formal, uh, a new organizational aspect to gay humanist campaigning. And the gay humanist group, which became the Gay and Lesbian Humanist Association, which became LGBT humanists as, as it now is, um, did and does still um, incredibly uh, important work in the UK. And today, I would say that in the UK, and for the last 30, 40 years, moving into, a, as it were, a third phase um, of humanist campaigning for LGBT equality, I would say that the role of, of gay humanist campaigning today um, is really to be avant-garde. We're ahead of the curve and we're out in front on, on, on an enormous range of issues. Today, we hear a lot of, in the UK about um, the, the banning of so-called conversion therapy, um, where either religious groups or fake um, uh, psychiatrists, you know, alleged fraudulent psychiatrists, um, say that they can cure you of being gay or cure you of your gender confusion in the case of trans people. And... Um, We've brought, brought now to the point in the UK where most political parties, all political parties, I think here in power at least, agree that this practice should be banned. Um, but it was organisations like LGBT humanists that for, first brought it to light 40 years ago. They identified this as an issue and had begun campaigning um, to, to, um, to end it. Um, LGBT humanists was the first organisation in the UK to adopt the International Day Against Homophobia, something that now is widespread throughout society and, and across the world. Um, they were one of the first organisations to push for full um, same-sex marriage equality. Of course, humanist celebrants have been doing non-legal same-sex weddings for decades um, for, for same-sex couples, but LGBT humanists were one of the first organisations to push um, for marriage equality. So again and again on, on, on these sorts of issues, or like the, from the Gender Reassignment Act, which is a key piece of trans rights legislation in the UK, in all of these other um, areas, um, gay humanists have been out in front. They've been developing these issues as issues before even uh, not just wider society, but a lot of other ad LGBT advocacy groups have even thought that these could be issues or might be issues. So there's a, there's a great role um, and a continuing role um, for humanist groups. Um, I think in the UK and in Europe, to continue their advocacy for LGBT rights by being ahead of the curve, by being, you know, the leaders of social change in the vanguard, really, um, still underpinned as ever by the ethical principle that goes on giving, you know, the, 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 the idea that human freedom uh, should only ever be limited by the rights and freedoms of others, a principle which is so far still from seeing complete realisation, of course, um, anywhere in the world. And outside the UK, I've given you a potted history in a sense of the UK and the sort of three waves of, of humanist activism on LGBT issues that um, have existed. But outside the UK, um, humanist organisations um, are incredibly closely associated with the cause of LGBT equality. There's, 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 there's not a humanist organisation in the world, really, from Uganda to the Philippines, um, where humanists aren't active 
in the cause of LGBT rights and women's rights and the rights of children and democracy activism usually. These are the modern causes that go together very often with humanist activists. And in fact, one of the reasons why it's sometimes difficult to um, get Western governments interested in the persecution of humanists in countries where humanists are persecuted, which is unfortunately too many, is because it's never a straightforward freedom of belief issue with a humanist activist. You know, governments take action quite often on the persecution of Christians, and it's easy for them to do so because they can straightforwardly say, ah, oh, this poor woman is being persecuted because she's a Christian. When humanists are being persecuted, they're often they're being persecuted for their humanism, often very much so for their for their non-religious beliefs and, and, and morals and values. But they're normally also being persecuted for their advocacy for LGBT rights, for their advocacy for the rights of women, for their advocacy of democracy, which complicates the picture. But it goes to show that a humanist approach to life is not just a personal one and a social one, but it's a political one. You say something about the world um, and how it should be when you adopt a, a humanist identity and join a humanist um, organization, certainly. And, and so that is the case today. And we see, unfortunately, um, humanist organisations targeted not just for their um, for the humanism they represent, but for the wider cause of equality they represent on these on these different grounds. So that's one way in which um, today internationally humanists are still very much associated with LGBT rights. They pick up that agenda wherever they wherever they form. And largely, there's something about exclusion there. I think, you know, it's it, there's a tendency not just um, for the scientific and moral reasons that we've said for humanists in these countries to um, be active on LGBT rights. There's also a, a solidarity with, with, with people who are similarly excluded. Um, and that's, um, in academic literature, that's one of the reasons why uh, humanists in the 19th century are um, uh, identified as having been very involved in, for example, anti-slavery campaigning and in race equality. It's because there um, was a fellow excluded group, and so they felt empathy with the with with people who were excluded. And that's the case still now for for humanists and LGBT people um, in many countries in the world. So that's the first thing. And the second uh, thing to say about that is that, of course, um, the other relevant connection uh, between humanist organizations internationally and the rights of LGBT people internationally is that there is an almost complete overlap if you look at the map of the world between the countries um, where homosexuality is not just still criminalized but actively uh, punished through the criminal law and countries where um, to be non-religious is similarly criminalized and punished. So there is a total overlap as there was um, in the past in Europe too um, between religiosity in a society or more strictly speaking in, in a state, you know, the more religious a state is, the more informed by religion its laws are, the more persecuted, alienated, disadvantaged and oppressed are LGBT people, certainly gay people in those societies. So for as long as that's true, and I think it'll be true at least for the rest of our lives, um, there's a strong affinity between humanist organizations and the humanist cause and the cause of human rights and equality for LGBT people. And I'm sure that um, as humanist organization picks up even more in Australia than it already has, you'll all be uh, joining in that cause internationally. And perhaps we could have some discussion about that now. Thank you, Andrew. Um, does anyone have, have any Jeff? comments or questions? I was just wondering if we've lost Jeff. Um, he did say that he sometimes have troubles, has troubles with his connection. Um, and I offered to take over if that happened. It may have happened. And it has <laughs> happened. It's happened. <laughs> I commend the con con comments of Edward Dwyer in the in the uh, comment box here. I agree with all of those. Actually, what I was going to say was it's there actually... You are, what, you are Edward a, Dwyer. Hello. Yeah, I am actually, yeah. Um, it's interesting because um, you look at Ireland, for example, the most high Catholic state ever. ever. They've just overturned all these religious taboos that once, even under Eamon de Varela, Everyone who opposed them was actually shot shot down by the church and the government, you know. Yeah, especially on Jeremy Delaware. Yeah, and I mean they've they've even now got an openly gay president, prime minister or president. Prime minister, and prime even minister. better, he marched, he marched with our banner at the at the Pride in Belfast. He he wore, he chose to march under the LGBT humanist banner That's at right. the Prime and, Minister. And he even <laughs> had his photo taken with um, um Mike Pence and his when he was visiting Very his funny, partner really. too, which 
Well, that's a, that's sort of like, uh, no? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ireland, I think, has been a really object lesson, and so has Spain, actually, although less in the headlines. Spain is very similar. They're countries where there's been a very rapid and sudden collapse um, of the sort of authoritarian Catholic morality that once... That's right. <coughs> the old Franco days society. are gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. God. Exactly. <clears throat> Yeah. And in both those countries, you know, the abolition of blasphemy laws in Spain and in Ireland in, in recent years and the abolition, the, the reform of um, the school systems to make them um, more secular um, and, and the progress of LGBT rights in both those places. It's been quite, quite, quite remarkable, really. And it's, 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 it's been prompted in both cases by a, um, a large, num a large uh, a great deal of scandal in the Catholic Church. You know, the, Catholic, the Catholic Church as an institution has become, you know, just so mired in its own depravity really very visibly yeah. in public in public eyes yeah. um that you know that has prompted i think a secularization in part of the of the of, the, of those countries whose social systems once relied very heavily on the catholic catholic provision so yeah i mean it's it's a remarkable remarkable um pay the pace of change is remarkable yeah but while there's been a pace of change with especially with this present government is They've been trying to put through that bill, the religious freedom right, you know. The so, Australian government you're referring to. Australian now. government, Australian yeah. Now. yeah. Um, especially, um, oh God, what's his name? The Christian lobby fella. Um, oh. Lyle something? Yes, I know yeah. what you mean. Lyle Shelton. Sheldon. Shelton? 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 Lyle Shelton. Mm. Yeah, like um, they've been for the protection of religion against them. Um, you know, the dreaded, you know, gay gene mm. that's going to come and uh, just, you know, convert them and something shit like that. Oh, you know? really? <laughs> yeah, that's basically the rubbish that was put out. And then, no, what happened was, and they had this whole debate in Australia, we had this thing, uh, the likes of jo Barnaby Joyce coming about, family values, we have to have family family values. values. Yeah, and um, all these people, some of these people that came out with these family values, they were the complete opposite. Why did he just made his, made his, girl, his secretary pregnant? Yes. <laughs> I was just going to say to Andrew, I don't know if he's heard the sad story of Barnaby Joyce and his secretary. Uh, <laughs> no, I haven't. Yeah, he actually, it's, he it got sounds like it's a familiar story. He lost story. the leadership. He lost the leadership at the Nationals. Usual. He tried to say, well, he left his wife. He was disgraced. And he became the loudmouth rogue of, of New England, the New England uh, electorate, no? <laughs> he still was, is. This is all sounding very <laughs> sentimental so far, but what is this uh, <coughs> religious bill you're talking about? That's the religious discrimination bill. That, religious uh, discrimination. Um, currently that, is to say, that is to say, because there was a case in America where a gay couple wanted to have a cake made and, they, and someone made a fuss to say, basically, well, you're asking me to make a cake. Uh, okay, now... Uh, it's pretty common sense, I reckon. If someone doesn't want to make a, if they, someone doesn't want to make cake a cake for someone, they can say no. Then the other party can say, well, you're not going to make the cake. No, no one's going to force that person to make this make a cake for a wedding. If, that this was a that one of the one of the things that issues that was coming up, you know, in that particular case in the United States, because this the, the the cake maker went to the the, the courts, um, and. Really, it's just, he could have just said, no, I'm making the cake. And then they would have said, no, well, you're not making the cake. We'll get someone else to make it. A lot of these cases are, are prompted, although they present as legal cases, they're often prompted really by quite wealthy lobby groups behind That's the scenes. That's exactly who's right. I was going to say fund, that. They, fund this litigation. Yeah, yeah. there's someone behind it who's actually pushing it to make, to push the That's point. That's right. Yeah. Well, uh, what, what was the case now? It was quite famous. The cake maker was litigated against, was he? No, he wasn't. He wasn't. No. Um, yeah, there were two cases. There's one. There's one in the United States which went to the Supreme Court, and then there was one in um, in Northern Ireland as well at around the same time, actually. Um, so he which, wasn't litigated mm -hmm. against. What What happened then? I'm not familiar with the American case. Perhaps um, Edward Dwyer is, but the in in the, in in the in, in in Northern Ireland. Um, yes, the the person who wanted the cake sued the baker and said that they should provide it to them. Um, because in Northern Ireland, um, there is anti-discrimination law based on your sexual orientation and your politics, for obvious reasons, because of the sectarian history of Northern Ireland. Um, and so um, he said that it was unlawful for the baker not to have um, 
done the cake for him, um, but he lost his case. Um, I'd just like to ask participants to keep their questions brief, please, and allow Andrew to um, answer. It's, um, it's Andrew's... There haven't been uh, any questions yet. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone actually I'm, have I'm any questions like that just like, talking. <laughs> to, uh, like to ask? I can see someone called Debbie who's waving, but I don't know whether you can see her. Um, Debbie, do you have a question? I do indeed. Um, when it comes to humanism, and, oh, and a uh, very good talk, by the way. Um, when it comes to humanism and activism, um, I find sometimes it can be a little hard to articulate why or what the humanist approach is in the sense that um, I think with a lot of these issues, you just kind of look at it and go, well, yeah, because that's what any decent right-thinking human being would do. Is there, an, is there a way that you approach these things that um, has been very successful at framing it as a humanist approach? Like, are there any sort of aspects that you uh, tend to emphasise or a way that you approach it that makes it very clear that this is, you know, this is coming from a humanist? Were you here right at the beginning when I talked about the two ways in which, for example, LGBT equality was relevant to a humanist point of view, understanding the world through reason, evidence and, and the moral, the morality of freedom of choice? Yeah, I think that, that that's the way to do it. Um, and, and that is a humanist approach. I mean, I suppose behind your question, you're sort of saying the problem is that the humanist approach in the last 120 years has become very successful. And for a lot of people, it's become a sort of common sense. And so it's lost its distinctiveness as a, the distinctiveness that it had um, about 120 yeah. years ago. And of course, that's true. Um, but I think when, when, whenever someone uses a phrase like all, all decent right thinking people like you did, I think, well, if that's the case, then why are there any problems left in the world? You know, it can't really be the case that there's all these decent, right-thinking people who who have these uh, who have these views. So I think sometimes we need to sort of pull it back and say, well, no, this is um, you know, common sense is not that common. Um, and so to have a word that describes this particular um, uh, approach uh, to to life and to and to moral questions is is still quite valuable but it is a branding problem all over the world in in the netherlands they deal with it interestingly by talking about two 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 humanisms they talk about you know they when they ever talk about humanism they say there's the humanist organizations and the humanist movement um but then there's also you know the, the humanism of society you know most dutch people believe in these values they have these humanist values and they just sort of identify that in that way you know those values with um uh, with the humanist view. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's largely the case. And I don't think you should forget how radical and strange in the context of human history, the humanist idea um, that every human being has an equal claim to happiness um, and that, you know, your rights um, should extend only so far as the rights and freedoms of others, but they should extend that far and should never be limited by anything else. These are two incredibly radical ideas which are solely down to the humanist sentiment of the last couple of hundred years, you know. So I would try and own that if, if I were you, you know, make it clearer that that's where it comes from um, and, 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 and lay a firmer claim to that. But it is a tension, isn't it? Because on the one hand, you want, you, we want these ideas to be absorbed by everybody. Um, and so in a way we want to say things like, well, of course, this is just common sense. Or this is just what decent right thinking people would think. Um, the risk then is that you sort of lose um, substance and, and, and that is an ongoing, ongoing tension. I see it in another sense, it's, it's evident in countries where humanist ceremonies have been incredibly successful, like the UK. So humanist funerals have been incredibly successful, so successful that many religious funerals are now humanist funerals, except for in, in name, you know, Church of England funerals now are not like they were in the past. They're much more about the person who's died. They're much more about celebrating a life. They include personalized readings. They're much more shaped to the person. They're not just the sort of like Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, insert name of dead person, <laughs> Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ prayers that they used to be. They're not like that anymore. They've humanized. And there's all these other celebrants now in the UK as well, who are sort of copying human, have copied the model of humanist funerals, but are just offering what they call just funerals. Now, and they're squeezing, as it were, the, the market share of funerals. If you wanted to think a bit about it commercially, I can't think of a better phrase for the moment. The market share of humanist celebrants who were once our celebrants were the only non-religious providers. Now, you could ask yourself, is that a failure? Is that a problem for humanism? Or, or is it a success? 
is it a success that you know someone from the church of england transported 100 years from the past to now would look at a church of england funeral and would go oh my goodness what is this humanist funeral in church <laughs> you know is that a success maybe that's a success and and so i don't know and it's the same with 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 the moral question and the political question that you're asking you know which 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 way around should we see it as a, as a as a triumph for humanism that humanist values some of them at least are now just the wallpaper of the western world because they're so embedded and so um, far reaching into our, our very sort of culture and consciousness or should we see it as a problem because we can no longer clearly and firmly identify a humanist approach and use it as a platform to build future change I don't know um, but my recommendation would be uh, my observation of where humanist campaigning is successful would be that it is to lay the best tactic is to lay claim to these values frame them clearly make it obvious where they come from for us um, whilst you know retaining the space to work collaboratively collaboratively with other people who share those values they think for religious reasons um or whatever um and uh, and work from there thank you thank does you. anyone else have a question there's one in the chat as well but paul 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 has his hand up paul loring Hi, hello uh, paul yeah i am um... When you uh, introduced yourself and said how cold it was back in the UK, it uh, really warmed my heart. Being a, a pommy bastard like you, I, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm glad to have left those... Um, <laughs> I bet you are. It's snowing, <laughs> Paul. It's snowing. <laughs> <laughs> those cooler temperatures behind. <laughs> so it always makes my day when I, I hear what it, how, just how awful it is back Thank here. you so <laughs> much, Paul. I think it's called schadenfreude. Yeah, you're really... It's very, uh, <laughs> very enjoyable for me too <laughs> but uh, yeah to get to the point um yeah uh, um uh, up until um the humanist australia is rejuvenated humanism in australia I, I was a member of the the west australian association we were all state-based associations a, a few years ago but it really f fell into um into disuse and um, and I, I'd spoken to Marianne about that sort of history. A lot of it was because well-meaning people joined the humanist group and, and they joined from the perspective of humanitarian causes rather than for humanism. And so um, it's been one of the, 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 the concerns that I've had since then of that um, how do we actually embrace the worthy humanitarian causes without actually losing the, the humanist aspect? And so um, as, as you were talking about this association, which is uh, specifically about um, the, the gay humanists having their own organization, that I can see that from the history that you've given us, that the benefits that have been derived for the gay community from humanists, and also though more recently how the, 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 the push for gay rights has had a knock on effect then on other more broader rights. But I, I, I'm also wondering though about how easy it is for humanists to be sidetracked into humanitarian issues and, and nobody then comes to the rescue of humanism nice i see what you mean yeah, so the priority then becomes the, the the humanitarian cause and thank you very much humanists for that but are the the humanitarian causes equally um supportive and promoting of humanism uh, and um, so I was wondering how that was happening in the parts of the world where you're dealing in, in the internet. Yeah. And the second yeah, question I'm... I was thinking about was also about younger people. So I'll come back to that in a minute. Oh, okay, fine. Well, I mean, that there are two, I think there are, there are your question is, is too complicated to answer um, briefly. Um, and it also has different answers depending on where we're looking in the world and also where we are in terms of time. I mean, you know, and it changes throughout time as well. I mean, when you think about human, the humanist movement, the humanist organizations, we're looking, we've got, and we want to make judgments based 
you know, based on the sort of questions that you're asking, what's best to do and what will happen if dot, dot, dot. The good thing is we've got, you know, a good 130 years of evidence of humanist organisations and, and a good sort of bit of global evidence as well from the different humanist organisations that exist around the world about what works. But unfortunately, I think the conclusion that you did would one would deduce from all of that um, is that the answer is it depends. <laughs> you know, it, it, it depends um, where you are, when you are, and what you're trying to achieve, and and, and very much it depends on your sort of national context, right? So, um, the the most obvious difference being that humanist organisations in 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 very religious countries are in a different position from humanist organisations in relatively non-religious countries. I mean, societies, um, and um, the question of whether it makes sense to focus on, as it were, um, separation of church and state, the human right to uh, thought, conscience and belief for non-religious people and humanists, um, and um, the equal recognition of humanists together with religious people in society and law and, and so on, whether it makes sense to focus on that, um, which the humanist, the 20th century humanist Yap von Prague called the little fight, or whether it makes sense to focus on um, the uh, freedom of choice for every person, freedom of thought and expression for every person, humanitarian principles, which Yap von Prague called the big fight, um, I think depends on your social context. I think that it wouldn't make much sense for the Humanist League of the Netherlands to focus all day, every day on freedom of conscience for the non-religious because it's largely achieved in the Netherlands. So it makes sense for them to focus on, on, on bigger issues, you know, the right to die with dignity for every human being in the Netherlands, um, sexual and reproductive health rights of women and so on. Um, so, I, I, so, so, so to some extent, it depends on national context and a lot of other factors as well. However, having said all of that, my preference is always to encourage, this is the approach I've taken as Chief Executive of the Humanist UK, and the approach I take as President of Humanist International to encourage others to to foster both platforms, you know, to do both things um, as best you can. And that doesn't mean getting lost in um, 100 different campaigns. I think in terms of active campaigns that a humanist organization can have on their books any one time, it's probably two or three, right? But it means that you've got a watching brief outside of your active campaigns on a whole range of different issues, both the generically humanitarian, although built on a firm humanist platform, you know, of, of, of human rights, of equal human dignity, of the pursuit of happiness, of freedom of choice affirmed and so on, um, the humanitarian uh, causes and specific humanist ones. But I think you need both actually, because otherwise the risk is that you look incredibly self-interested and that you're unable to provide a bigger framework for the issues that you're pursuing. So I think maintain Sometimes these can just be pious statements, you know, of policy and of intent, um, but but maintain them and, and make them authentic and, and refer to them when you develop your campaigns, um, which are the, the much smaller number of, of issues on which one can be active at any one time. Um, but, you know, I don't think that the, the, the humanitarian fight, as, as, as you call it, um, is not the humanist one. I think it is. It's just one of the, the humanist ones. Um, Andrew, we're getting close to um, an hour now. Um, do you have time to stay a bit longer? I've, I see Paul Thompson's hand up and there's a question from Kendrick um, in the chat. I'm a notorious waffler when I answer questions, unable <laughs> to give brief answers to simple questions, especially before I've had my tea, which I haven't had yet. Um, a cup of tea, I mean. And so um, I can do four more questions. How about that? All right. Um, so we have Kendrick... Um, then Paul, then Natalia, um, and then one more after that. Should so Kendrick, I take the question from the chat? I'll, yeah. I'll read it for you. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, Kendrick asks, how do you have a conversation with someone who has a strong opposition to pro-LGBT plus issues, whose worldview has been deeply influenced by religious indoctrination? Well, I think in all these conversations, this sort of conversational activism some people call it when you're speaking to someone uh, with a view to changing their mind not just to learning their opinion you know and having a nice chat um, I think in all these sorts of um, activist conversations that you have with, with with people whose views are different from yours I think it's usually sensible to focus on on the person on the on an individual not the person you're speaking to I mean a person give the example of a person um, I think it's important to personalize these uh, issues as quickly as possible in any conversation, not to remain in the 
world of abstract principles of pro and anti LGBT, you know, whatever, or pro and anti women's rights, whatever, or pro and anti abortion, whatever, or pro and anti assisted dying or whatever. It's best, I think, to focus on an individual situation, an individual example of an individual person. And we know that works in people's individual lives. We know there's academic research on the effect of gay characters in films and television programs and the effect they've had on the liberalization of laws in countries where they've appeared. You know, all that's then that's just a proxy for the even bigger effect that people have when they have a gay grandchild or someone in their lives or you know, you know, something that, that happens. And it, and it's coming now even more with trans uh, people too. I mean some some of the the uh, loudest bigots um, that I've known on, on on trans questions, which of course are more complicated uh, these days than than uh, LGBT questions are. Um, some of the loudest bigots on those issues um, that I've known in the UK, at least two I can think of, have been transformed by having a trans person in their family suddenly, you know, come out. And so I think that you know these things just the the impact of that personal experience can be huge. And so I think to, to the greatest extent possibly, possible, we should try and replicate that in conversations, talk about individuals, talk about their lives, talk about the things um, that have happened to them and the things that um, they need. And with religious opponents of sexual orientation equality laws in the UK, I often found that a good thing to do was to talk about equality laws on religion or belief. I mean, we're lucky in the UK that um, the non-discrimination framework for LGBT people is exactly the same as the non-discrimination framework for people based on their religion or belief. So you can say to people, you know, you're protected on the grounds of your religion or belief. You can't be discriminated against in um, accessing a service. You can't be discriminated against in employment. You know, why do you want to deny to others the same protections that you have for your very important characteristics? Um, and of course, some people are irreducible bigots and will never be convinced. Um, but that number, I think, is, is very few. Um, so that's what I would do. Next question is from Paul. Go ahead, Paul. Paul Thompson. Paul Thompson. Yep. Here we go. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. You're very easy to listen to. Can you hear me OK, everyone? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, a side issue and then the main issue, which you might pick up. Uh, I find myself linked to what's called the Uniting Church in Australia, which is a church that has approved not only gay ministers, but gay marriage. And like you said, there's a, a change in attitude. And so the side point I want to just ask us to think about is, while the church in many ways has been kind of backward looking, it only reflects a wider conservatism in society, which really hasn't got much to do with religion, but much more to do with culture and heritage and so on. Now, going to a more difficult one, Andrew, it's the B, LGB. And um, in our society, it seems like, with apologies to everyone, it's pretty easy to be gay nowadays, theoretically. But being B- You're talking about Australia, aren't you? Everywhere. Oh, but in everywhere. Australia especially. Being B and wanting to be intimate with a man and a woman and polyamory and all that stuff and anything that challenges monogamy is truly difficult. And so gay people can come out, but bisexual people are still in the closet. And you know, much could be said, but I suppose what we could ask is, would you like to reflect on whether in the history that you've described or in the current trends, the B side of these uh, of this issue is being treated or should be treated distinctly because it raises enormously difficult and different questions from just being gay. Am I, am I being unkind? To who? Oh, sorry, I didn't understand the last bit. But I said, um, am I being unkind? Oh, I, did, I didn't understand that bit. Sorry, I didn't know who you were being unkind to. I don't think you're being unkind to me. Um, no, I understand your question. Um, I think, I mean, so it's, 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 of course, it's very difficult to um, uh, to give one answer for every phase, as it were, of, 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 of the history, like I say that, like you said, that I've been talking about, because quite often um, what campaigners are taking on is actual laws. That, that are very specifically about one group of people, right? So for example, it wasn't, it wasn't a criminal offense for two women to have sex in the UK. 
it was a criminal offence for two men to have sex. So, I mean, so often the sort of campaigns we're talking about um, are targeting specific instances of persecution or oppression or, or discrimination. Um, and of course, you're quite wrong to say it's easy around the world now to, to be gay. People get executed for being gay. People get, you know, I mean, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, and that's, you know, that's, that's still in most countries in the world. So um, that, that's something to remember. But um, I, I think probably you're right generally that there's a, a sort of, um, so I know that bisexual people face, you know, um, social prejudice of all sorts, um, uh, and and that and that and that carries on. People uh, misconstrue their their lives and um, ask, you know, you know, have inappropriate views about bisexual people. Um, I I suppose that I suppose the distinction for me mm. is that often when you're talking about campaigning, you're talking about changing the law or changing some policy. Um, and the question of changing people's opinions on, on, on things and sort of social activism and, and trying to achieve social change as opposed to political and legal change, I think is something that we just have to do through the example of our own lives and also through, you know, education. And, and, and like I say, things like, you know, the stories we tell ourselves as a society, whether they're films or soap operas or novels and so on. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the best I can come uh, to an answer. Uh, on your first point about... Um, the impact, as it were, of sort of cultural conservatism rather than religion per se. I think that's true sometimes and not all the time. I mean, there are there are um, countries and um, periods in history in every country when it has been religious institutions sort of jealously guarding and even controlling the means of education, for example, in order to just perpetuate their own view. And so what looks like cultural conservatism can sometimes, if you dig deep into it, really still be religious institutions controlling the piece. Uh, but of course you're right um, that sometimes it's cultural conservatism. And I think that, you know, um, outmoded law, conform a sense of conformity, conservative traditions, religious institutions, these are all possible sources of um, life inhibiting and choice inhibiting and anti-humanist sentiments. And I would put them all in the dock, not just one of them. We have two questions remaining, uh, both in the chat from Natalia first and then from Paul Loring. Natalia asks, if humanism <clears throat> is about embracing love and compassion, then why are there humanists who attack traditional religion? Are we speaking of humanism itself or secular humanism? All right. Well, there's two questions there, of course. So the, fir the first one about um, humanism and religion. Um, well, I'd like to think that humanists uh, attack traditional religion when, when that religion is a barrier to love and compassion. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are, there are, it's a bit like the answer I gave before. I mean, you know, the, the anti-humanist forces in this world very often are religious um, because religions are based on... Um, premises that are antithetical to a humanist view. Um, for example, um, any religion that puts the source of meaning and fulfillment outside of human beings invested in some external deity or some other narrative of life is going to produce outcomes for people that are that are different from, from, from the humanist ones. Um, so, and in many parts of the world, of course, there is, there is, there is a, a very strong correlation. Um, and I'd say there's a causative rela causal relationship between parts of the world that are very religious and parts of the world where women, children, LGBT people and others are oppressed, denied their freedom, persecuted and killed. And religion inspires, as we know, um, great, great hate, great destruction, um, just as it can you know, inspire good things too, but certainly inspires those bad things. And so I think that's why humanists have, humanist organisations have um, attacked religion because they see it as destructive, harmful, um, threatening um, and then of course there are people who care about truth and they see religions as not not just destructive harmful uh, and so on on in a moral sense in, in people's lives but just untrue you know encouraging people to believe things that are not true um, and many people and many humanists think that it's important to seek truth um, and to try and live in 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 the greatest possible correspondence with reality that you can so I think that's why um, humanists often have religion in their in their sights um, and, and, and that's the, that question. The second part, secular humanism, I mean, I've actually written uh, uh, quite a bit about this. Um, the, the word humanism in English anyway, um, in UK English, um, came to us in the 19th century from the German humanismus. Um, and it's always uh, meant 
um, this non-religious view. The term secular humanism was coined in America um, and uh, very, very recently in the 60s and um, is an attempt to suggest that there are two humanisms, a secular humanism, a religious humanism. And now that anyone can edit Wikipedia at their whim, this idea has become spread. Um, I think the idea needs to be resisted. I, I, I don't think there's a value in trying to cut humanism into secular humanism and religious humanism. Um, and actually, I think that the attempt to do so is an attempt um, by religious people to try and co-opt humanism and, 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 and dilute it. May I add to that um, first question there? Um, attacking religion is a very, very different thing from attacking religious people. And I believe as humanists, we should be attacking religious ideas while treating religious people with compassion and respect. Well, we should treat everyone with compassion and respect, yeah. Yes. yes. You mean the fundamentalists or something of that sort? Uh, well, it's difficult, isn't it? Because of course, fundamental, oh, I'm so sorry, Marianne. I was just going to say, still having um, respect when you're speaking to them, but um, attacking to those, uh, attacking their ideas, uh, their harmful ideas and their their harmful actions. Sorry, I'll um, I'll, I'll shut up now, <laughs> Andrew. No, not at all. I think this Metalia was it. Is it Metalia? Was um, yeah, yeah, Metalia was going to say something else. Do you mind if we just have a follow up before we go to the last question? Uh, no, I was just thinking about you know like the Crusades and all those sorts of historical events that were major and it's, you know, it's like um, sort of like receiving revelation from God, like Constantine and mm. he's trying to like conquer the empire. So you're saying that's actually like, is it evil or is it just, you know, does it, in your opinion, make society actually better with religion or you're just- well. I understand the question. I think it's such a big question, isn't it? The question of whether or not re religions, religions, um, so many different religions have, have, have been, you know, a net positive or a net harmful uh, thing uh, to human beings. And I suppose it, 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 the, the answer is similar to another one that I gave earlier, which is it depends. I mean, you know, the, to the extent that um, religions have had cohesive effects on society and managed to amplify morality and to hand on traditions, but they've had useful value for, for human beings in the past, maybe they even do today. Um, but as ways of understanding the world around us, as ways of finding the right values to live by, as sources of meaning in a world that is so different from the world in which the, these religions were invented, uh, I think that they, they, they have no positive impact um, today and that the negative impact is, is very, very high because they're based on things that are not true. Um, and I think the only way that we can build our morality today in, in our interconnected world is on the basis of common humanity and the facts of the matter in the here and now. So um, th th that's my answer uh, to that. Um, um, what, if you don't mind, I'm just... And, what about like the, you know, the pop regime of Kim Roche? That's not actually based on religion. That's... You know, sorry, I can't hear... What about the what, sorry? Pol Pot. The Pol Pot regime and, you know, the... Oh, Pol Pot uh, regime. Yeah, well, no, that's right. Absolutely right. Um, and like, and, and I think any, um, well, I think it is sort of based on religion. I mean, it's based on ideology and a, a sort of inhumane ideology that um, is not based on, I mean, I'm not just anti-religion, obviously, I'm in favour of humanist values, which um, are about the equal dignity of human people, um, the maximising of human freedom and happiness and choice up to the limits of, of the rights and freedoms of others, as I've said repeatedly, and, uh, and, and, um, and obviously the regime of Pol Pot um, is just as antithetical to those humanist values as, um, you know, uh, medieval Europe, so, or, or Stalinist Russia, or, or modern China. You know, so I would say that, uh, I would say that. I think we do need move, to move on to our final question so that Andrew can go get his cup of tea. He's very I do need it. A, a cup of tea. The last one was from Paul Loring. How do you encourage greater involvement of younger members rather than old farts like me who are time rich and can ponder the big issues? <laughs> well, we need, pe we need people who are time rich, of course. Um, very important in any movement to have people who've got the time um, to, to help out um, and to do the, the work. I don't know the answer to this question. I mean, in the UK, about a quarter of our members are under 35, which is a good proportion. Um, in some humanist organisations in the world, um, they're all young, you know, uh, the global south, 
um, all members of humanist organizations are young pretty much, um, but then a huge proportion of the population is young as well. So it's it sort of just measures the, it tracks the, the normal population. I'm afraid I don't know enough about Australian society to say. Um, if it's anything like um, other um, Western liberal democracies, then sort of you know, and capitalist societies at our stage in, 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 in global history, I would suggest that it's probably um, important to find uh, one or two really compelling causes um, and that people will, will be attracted to you on those on those grounds. Um, and of course, to move online, I mean, you know, the if you think of something like Human Issue UK, which I just will just I'm familiar with it, um, our local groups, which have a, a much older demography, um, exist for their meetings and so on. Um, and I suppose there's a few thousand people who are members of local groups around the UK. But you know, our Facebook page has 20 million impressions a year or whatever. So I mean, it's it's a uh, it, that's the way to. To, to obviously, I think reach reach younger people who who do who do much less in person than people of previous generations. Uh, that and a, and a cause, you know, um, which which can attract uh, activist young people at least. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm I, I can't. Um, I think possibly you should get in touch with Humans International about this because they will have good good case studies from around the world. We have set up the Human Union campaign platform um, in order to campaign on social issues and also to try to attract more people and younger people to humanism. Um, so that's that's one thing we're doing. We're campaigning on a number of issues there. The most active one at the moment is um, whistleblower protection. We have a number of cases before the courts at the moment, high profile whistleblowers who are being persecuted. Um, a lot of stuff in the chat which i don't have yes, time the, to read i know uh, there are some questions that i would like to answer but i think we have run out of time haven't we we have i think annoyingly <laughs> um jeff are you with us again what happened to jeff i think we may have lost him so i will um thank yeah, you no he's there he's waving no, he's waving uh, i am here uh, okay oh, no. good yeah. i have been dropping out of thank you Look, I'd, I'd like to thank Andrew for what he's said tonight. He's certainly given given us all um, certainly some information and some grounds for thought. Um, I, I, I was personally particularly impressed with his um, comments about um, part, part of change is addressing the law. And I know, for example, um, there are apparently about 35 out of 54 Commonwealth countries at the moment that still criminalise homosexuality in one form or another. And I think that's not only possibly a challenge for humanists in the UK, but probably around the world, including in Australia, where we still remain part of the Commonwealth. Um, I, I think there's other issues, as Andrew's um, pointed out, the humanist movement in, in UK has certainly been larger in terms of numbers and more vibrant than in Australia. And I think that's something that we're aiming to change or hoping to change. And I'd like to thank Andrew for what he said. I think um, I've seen some people in the chat making comments about where do we go from here and how do we respond and what do we do? So there is already some interest in, in doing things and hopefully being part of the change. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for coming tonight and for contributing. And uh, I'd like to um, invite people to con continue to come to Zoom meetings for Humanists Australia and for Rainbow Atheists. Um, uh, unless Mary Ann would like to add any further comments or Andrew, I'd like to thank you. Well, I just endorse everything you say, get active, start organizing, you know, adopt causes, pursue agendas, um, do a lot of things. And then, you know, even if only a few work, you'll have won. <laughs> Thanks so much, Andrew. It's been great to see you again. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. Thanks. And thank you to everyone who came tonight. Um, and I do hope you'll, um, you'll check out Humanists Australia, um, look us up online, um, join if you feel that you're a humanist. Um, and good night.